size, shape, and color that give individuals the best chance to survive and reproduce are passed on to subsequent generations. All of these eyes have evolved to work best for the animals that use them. The eye is one of nature's marvels, but the first living organisms didn't have eyes at all. So how did something so complex evolve? Darwin himself said that it made him shudder to think of how something so complicated could have happened by natural selection. But it's actually quite easy, and we're going to look at just one way it could have happened. The simplest eye that you can imagine is a patch of light-sensitive cells. And in fact, many animals, like flatworms, still have eyes like this today. Here we have a model of such an eye. These are the light-sensitive cells. Now, this can be useful in order to tell an animal whether or not it's day or night, for instance. But drawback. As I move the light around, it cannot tell where the light is coming from. As an eye, it's really rather limited. But we should remember that biological surfaces are often quite flexible. And so if some of the offspring of these animals could have had slight indentations, and when you get an indentation, then you can start to get a shadow around the rim, which can tell you where the light is coming from. And that brings us to the next stage. So, now our patch of light-sensitive cells is lining the edge of this shallow bowl on the surface of an organism. It works pretty well like it did before, but when I start moving the light, you can see a shadow appearing. And where the shadow is depends on where the light is. As a result, while this is very good, it's not a great eye, it's a lot better than the one before. This, for instance, can tell us maybe where a predator's coming from. And the thing about this kind of eye is that the deeper it gets, the better the effect. And so the most obvious thing to do now is to start bringing the surface in again to make a sort of sphere inside the organism. And the more that happens, the better it gets. So now all of our light-sensitive cells are underneath the surface. They're reached by this small hole. It's almost completely closed up again. In order to show you what this does to our ability to tell where the light's coming from, we're going to have to take the camera underneath the table. But as you can see, where I'm shining the light is very, very clear. It's very precise at telling us exactly where the torch is coming from. And when you have a system like this, where there's a cavity which is reached through a small hole through which you shine light, then something really happens. We're here at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. And this is a camera obscura. It's a massive pinhole camera. Up above me in the roof, light is being shone through a small hole up there, reflected from the outside, down onto a white table in front of me. This white table is just like the patch of light-sensitive cells we were looking at earlier. Now, if you look at the table, you can see objects, like there's the Queen's house, and there's the Royal Naval College, and you can even see things moving, like people or cars. And remember, all of this is just with a mirror and a hole in the roof. It's as if we're standing in the middle of a huge eye. Eyes like this can still be found in the Nautilus. This animal has the most well-developed pinhole camera eye in the natural world and had to change it because this basic eye gives it all the information it needs. It hasn't changed because it's got the best eye for the job. So this is really quite impressive. Just a hole in the roof has managed to give us an image of the world outside. But it is a faint image. How can we make it better? Well, a lens is the obvious answer. But how could a lens evolve? We have to remember that this kind of eye is open to the outside world. And so a plug of mucus could be formed in order to protect the interior. And that plug of mucus, in time, could be selected to become clearer and thicker and much more like the lens that we know today. 